Hey guys, good morning. So glad you could worship with us. Uh, let's get our communion supplies ready and we'll see you after worship. Creation, everything. 
salvation is in his blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, his kingdom come. Now it's time to take communion together as the church. Annalise is going to read for us. Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. All right, then we're going to take the body and the blood together. We also have an opportunity to give. Uh, three ways to give. You can give online. You can text ICC Give to 77977, or you can mail check in the mail. Now we get our message. Hey, Islands, how we doing? Hey, last time that we were together, we started a conversation about a growing in our faith and growing up into Christian maturity. And we talked about our ego and how our ego operating in its natural state is what keeps us from growing up into our faith. It keeps us from growing into maturity. We said that our ego, when it's natural, it tends to be overinflated. It tends to be empty and painful, busy and fragile. And if you didn't have a chance to watch that video, I'd encourage you to go back right now to watch it because this is part two of this conversation. And we're going to be in the same text that we were in the last time over all three talks. And so if you want to go ahead and grab your Bibles in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and chapter 4, that's where we're going to be. Now, we're using a book by Tim Keller. The book is titled The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness as Our Guide. So I'd encourage you to read that, check that out. It's really short. You could read it this afternoon on your phone. You know, all of us as believers, I believe, all of us as followers of Jesus want to be mature in our faith. Like we know following Jesus that there's, there's something more, that, that we are uh, in progress. We just kind of sense that we're on our way to a deeper uh, following of Jesus, a deeper maturity. And I think that we want that to be true. If you remember in our last uh, conversation, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, asked this question. He said, are you not uh, acting like mere humans. And what's assumed in that question is that we as believers are called to be something more than mere humans. Like you and I, we can be something more than mere humans. And I think we want that to be true of us. I know I want that to be true of me. I want my life and my living every day with my kids and my wife and, and every day and as I interact with people, I want to be something more than just like a typical person. I want to be something more than just a mere human. And we believe as Christians that that's possible through our growing up in our faith, through our maturing in Christ. And so for us to grow in our faith, for us to actually develop maturity in Christ, our ego has to stop acting in its natural condition. It has to stop being natural. In other words, our ego has to be brought into the submission of Christ. It has to be uh, matured, if you will. It has to be filled up instead of blown up and empty. And today in this talk, what I want to talk to you about is what does it look like when our ego is not acting in its natural state? What does it look like when our ego is, is uh, functioning like a redeemed ego? What does your ego look like when it's no longer empty and no longer painful and no longer busy and no longer fragile, but instead your ego is filled up? How do we know we've gotten to that place? What does it look like when our ego is functioning like a redeemed ego and not a natural ego? That's the point of this talk. That's why we're having this conversation today. Now, we're in the same text that we were in last time, but I don't want to read the whole text to you again. I'm just going to read uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. And as a quick reminder, remember the church in Corinth is having lots of division and lots of fighting. And if you remember, they're fighting over who's the best Christian leader. You know, they're fighting over Paul and Apollos. And, you know, I follow Paul and I follow Paulus and I'm a better believer. They're having this really weird argument ab around uh, the, the, the Christian leaders. And so this is what the Apostle Paul writes to them. Check this out. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verses 1-4, through 4, this is what it says. This then is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. 
Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. And then verse 3, it's like a weird shift. He says, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. Verse 4, my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Now, what you've got to see that the Apostle Paul is doing here, uh, Paul in his writing, he's setting himself up as a model. That's what he's doing, all right? And so the Apostle Paul is telling these Christians in Corinth, hey, the reason you're fighting, the reason you have a problem, the reason all this is going on is because you're boasting, and you're boasting because your ego is, is acting in its natural state, and you need to stop that. You need to cut that out. And he's not just telling them to stop it and to cut it out. He's actually modeling for them how do we get to a place where our ego is redeemed? How do we get to a place where our ego is, uh, is not acting in its natural state, but is acting in a supernatural state, something as more than a mere human, right? So you, what you got to see in this text is Paul isn't just saying, hey guys, stop it. He's also modeling for them how he himself got to that place. He's saying, hey, this is how I got to the place where my ego stopped operating in its natural state. He's putting himself up as an example of a healthy ego. So if you look at verses 1 and 2, this is what he says happened for him. This is how he got to that place where his ego no longer was uh, at operating in its natural state, but was operating in a redeemed state. Look at verses 1 and 2 again. Um, he says, you know, look in that passage there in verses 1 and, t- 1 and 2. And this is my, like, you know, paraphrase. He's saying, look, I know I have an important job. I know God's asked me to do something that's kind of a big deal. And I know that, that the way we do it matters. But at the same time, I'm not thinking about how people judge me or how people view me. I'm not, even, I'm not thinking about how you're judging me. I'm not thinking about that. So he's saying there, and, and look, at, look at verse 3, he says, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. And so Paul's going, look, the way I got to this place is I recognize the fact that my job's important. I recognize the fact that God has entrusted me with kind of a big deal. But I'm not letting you judge me. I'm not letting anyone else judge me in that process. Now, the word judge there is like the word verdict. And so what he's saying is, hey, I'm not letting you decide the verdict about me. I'm not letting you decide the verdict about me. And that's, that's a very important first step in understanding how do we get to a, a healthy ego, a redeemed ego, and get away from our ego act, acting in a natural way. Is we stop looking to other people to give us the verdict about who we are, about how valuable we are, about what we're worth. And that's what Paul says he did first. And that's the first step for us to have an ego that is redeemed, is to stop looking to other people for the verdict about our value or our worth. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm not looking to any person or any human being or any court or any group of humans or any church, for this example, for my identity or my value or my worth. He says, I'm not looking to any person or any human court or any church to tell me that I am something or to tell me that I am important. Now, at this point in the talk, this probably relates with most of us watching because this kind of resonates with our culture right now. We can relate with words like this because we, think, we say things like this. Man, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I don't care what people say about me at all. Now, I'm willing to say this. You probably have used those words before. You've probably have said things like, I don't care what people think about me. I don't care what people say about me. But you know and I know that that's not always true even though you say that. You know how you know it's not always true? Because when you hear about somebody who said something negative about you or somebody who kind of snubbed you or somebody who didn't really talk to you, what happens to you? You get offended, right? You get, you get like, you're like, whoa, what's up with them? And you get all mad. And then if I was to like come into your life and say, wait a minute, hold on, man. You said you didn't really care what people thought about you. You didn't really care what people said about you. But now you're mad because they're over here talking about you. You see, we, we relate with this really well, this idea that I don't care what people talk, what people say about me, but we don't actually live this way. We don't actually have that freedom that Paul seems to have in this text. This freedom to actually live like I do not look to other people for a verdict about me. So if, it, so if saying it, like well, I don't care what people say about me, if saying it doesn't work, because we all still get offended when somebody says something about us we don't like, then how do we actually get to that place where I'm not looking for other people or other groups of people to have the verdict on me? 
Now, what most modern counselors would say, you know, if you sat down with a counselor and you said, I feel like too many people have the say on, on whether I'm valuable or important. You know, what most modern counselors would say is, well, you know what? You shouldn't worry about their standards. You shouldn't worry about what they think you should do. In, in other words, most modern counselors would say, you just need to decide what to be and go be it. And you, what most, uh, you know, therapists would tell you and modern counseling would tell you is that you need to decide your own standards, what you think is your own truth, and you need to live by your own truth. But Paul's not telling us to do that either. Paul does not do what we do. He does not go about this process of having a, a healthy ego the way our modern psychoanalysis would tell us to do it. And you know what that sounds like, right? Girl, you just got to go do you. Girl, you just got to be you. Boy, man, you just got to be you. You see, Paul's pathway to a healthy ego, an ego not acting in its natural state, could not be further from that. It could not be further from this idea that, man, you just got to be you. Notice that Paul says in this text, I don't care if you judge me, and I don't even care what any human court says about me. I don't care what either one of those things say about me. But then he takes it a step further in verse 3, and he says, I won't even judge myself. The words are this, indeed, I do not even judge myself. It's like Paul is saying this, hey, I don't care what you think, and guess what? I don't care what I think either. I don't care, uh, I, I, I don't care what, you, what your opinion is of me, but that's not all. I have a low opinion of my opinion of me. And so Paul, he's, he's kind of taking us a step further. We're really good at going, hey, I don't care what anybody says about me. I don't care what people say about me or what people, how people look at me. But you know it's not true because you get offended and you get your feelings hurt when you hear about something negative being said about you. And so Paul isn't saying, hey, the solution to having a healthy ego is to set your own standards and live by your own standards, nor is he saying the solution to having a healthy ego is to figure out what their standards are, other people's are, and live by theirs, right? The Apostle Paul is going, look, don't let other people judge you. Don't let other people pass verdict on you, but also don't pass verdict on yourself. Don't even judge yourself. And this is what the Apostle Paul knows. This is what he's trying to get them to see and what he's modeling for them and what he's trying to teach us as well. That pretending to meet standards, whether it's their standards or your own standards, pretending to meet standards is a trap. It's a trap. Look at verse 4. Verse 4 says this. It says, My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. You see, this is what Paul knows. Paul knows pretending to meet anyone's standard, anyone's standards for self-regard is a trap. So whatever your friends, whatever your, your uh, friend group believes um, will make you feel, you know, how you have to act to be valuable. Like if you try to meet those standards, if you try to meet other people's views and other people's ideas of how you're supposed to live, it's a trap. And when Paul says this, he says, look, my conscience is clear, but I also know I am not innocent. Now, what does he mean by that? What Paul, I believe, is saying is, look, I know I'm not innocent, and I'm not trying to fool anyone into believing I'm innocent. I'm not trying to convince myself. I'm not actually trying to convince you, the Corinthian Christians, that I'm innocent. I know that if I try to convince myself I'm innocent, man, I ain't done nothing wrong. You know that language, right? Man, I've done nothing wrong. We have to do our arms like that. I've done nothing wrong. I've done anything. Like if I try to convince myself I'm innocent, that's a trap. And that means my ego is going to get bigger and more distended and it's going to be more empty. It's going to be empty and it's going to be busy and it's going to be fragile and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be in pain. Like Paul knows if he tries to pretend like he doesn't have guilt, that is a trap. That's a, that's a problem for his, for his ego. And so he says, look, in, in verse 4, he says, look, I'm not pretending like I'm innocent. I'm not pretending like I don't have guilt. I've, I am guilty. I've let you guys down there in Corinth. I've let other Christians down. I've let people down all over the, uh, the, the, the world. I've let myself down. It's, verse 4 is what he's trying to say is, hey, I'm not trying to get my self-worth by meeting anyone's standards because I know that's a trap. I know that's something I can't do. And what happens is if I try to do it, I end up pretending, trying to convince you. And then I end up trying to convince myself. And I'm pretending like I'm innocent. And so he's just is kind of point blank saying, I'm never going to be able to meet your expectations. I'm never going to be able to see, be seen by you as somebody who's valuable and somebody who's important. So I'm just telling you right now, I am guilty. I can't meet your standards. 
I'm not going to fall for the trap. And I'm not going to try to convince myself that, man, I've done nothing wrong. I'm not going to try to convince myself that I'm good or feel good about myself. I'm not going to try to meet your standards because it's a trap. But also, the Apostle Paul, I think, is saying, I'm not going to try to meet my own standards either. Because that's what we all tend to try to do. So to try to make ourselves feel better about ourselves, we realize that I can't live up to other people's standards, right? We let our parents down. How many of you can tell stories about letting your parents down? We let our parents down. We let our spouse down. We let our friends down. We let our coworkers down. I mean, and that feeling of guilt and shame, it's just like, oh my goodness, I'm just tired of letting everybody down. And so we all kind of maybe sense that, even though if you're still on that train and trying, we just invite you to get off right now. You're not going to make them happy, okay? And the Apostle Paul is going, but I also don't try to, you know, meet my own standards. I don't try to judge my self-worth and my value and how important I am by how well I do at meeting my own standards. So think about it this way. You know, this is a common tactic for us to try to deal with our ego in its natural state. We try to say, I know I'm a good person. I do good things. I mean, I'm a good person. I do more good than bad. I'm a good person. And then all of a sudden you find yourself in the passing lane behind somebody driving like six miles below the speed limit. You know what I'm talking about? I think I'm a good person until I'm behind that guy in the left lane who will not speed up. And then I'm like, I don't know if I'm that good of a person as I thought I was. And so whenever we say, well, I, I mean, I'm a good person, we know deep down we can't even meet our own standards that we set for ourselves. And so we know that, that setting our own standards to feel good about ourselves is not going to work because we even let ourselves down. We even fail to meet our own standards. Now, the other option is you could set your standards so low that you could meet those standards, but then you would know eventually you're the type of person that sets really low standards to feel good about yourself, and then in turn you would feel bad about yourself. Do you see what I'm saying? And so the Apostle Paul is like, look, this is a trap. Don't you, don't you guys see that trap? It's a trap to think, uh, if I just, you know, I, if I can pretend to be innocent, if I can pretend to meet people's standards, if I can pretend to, to meet my own standards, then I'll be okay. Paul's like, that's a trap. Don't fall for that trap. And the way Paul's modeling for them and how he's showing them that he hasn't fall, fallen for that trap, he's trying to help them see and he's trying to help us see when he says, hey, I don't care what you think about me. And I don't care what anyone thinks about me. And as a matter of fact, I don't, even, I don't even care what I think about me. I don't try to get my value or my identity or my worth from meeting anyone's standards, even my own standard. And I'm telling you, friend, this is countercultural in a deep way for our society. Everyone you know is jockeying for position to try to feel valuable, to try to feel important by meeting someone's standards, whether it's their dads, their moms, a boss, a coworker, a spouse, or themselves. And Paul says it's a trap, and it leads to an inflated ego. It leads to a painful ego. It leads to a busy ego. It leads to a fragile ego. Don't fall for the trap. But when we decide, like the Apostle Paul, hey, I'm not looking to other people to give me my value and worth by meeting their standards. I know I can't do it. And I'm not even looking to my own self, you know, to decide that I've done a good job, to pretend like I'm, a, you know, I'm meeting the standards to feel good about myself. I'm not looking for the judgment of any person, whether an individual, a group, or this person, me. I'm not looking to the judgment of any person for my self-regard, for my view of self, for my identity, for my worth. I'm not doing that at all. And Paul says that's what it looks like when you have an el a healthy ego. This is what it looks like when you have a healthy ego. When we have a healthy ego that just works like a good shoulder just works, if you remember that from our last video, we have a healthy ego that just works. We don't get our self-regard from any person. We don't seek verdict from any other people. We just function. Our ego just functions. And that's how we know it's healthy. And I would push this a little bit further and say, when you stop trying to get the verdict from others, whether it's an individual or a group or yourself, when you stop trying to get the verdict of your value and your worth from other people, 
you don't consider their judgment as what gives you value, that all of a sudden your ego becomes free. And the Apostle Paul even models this freedom for us in other places. He writes a letter to a young man named Timothy. When Paul writes this letter, he's an older man. He's near the end of his life. You have to understand this. He's, he's, he's done ministry for a long time. He's been a Christian for a long time. And so he models for us the freedom that comes when we have a healthy ego that's functioning in a redeemed way. Look at this. This is from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. He says, Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Colon. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, dash, of whom I am the worst. Now here's Paul. He's a guy that we would not expect to admit this. He's a heavily influential guy. People all over the Christian world would have seen his writings and known who he was. But here he is in a letter late in his life as an old man saying, and not, he's not saying uh, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, sinners and of who I was the worst. He's not confessing to some past sin. The Apostle Paul is saying, here I am. All of you know me. You know that I've, you've read my writings. You know I'm influential. You know that people all over the world know me as a Christian leader, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And here he is saying, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. I'm the worst sinner there is. Now, man, that's something that's way off our maps. We cannot understand this. We don't understand how this could even happen. Here's a guy with crazy confidence, the Apostle Paul. He's writing to Christians all over the world. He's correcting them. He's rebuking them. He's telling them to get their act together. And the whole time he's correcting and rebuking and telling them to get their act together, he himself here is admitting, well, I don't always have my act together. How is that even possible? At the same time, he's doing ministry for God's church. He's acknowledging that his sin runs deep in his bones. I love what Spurgeon says. I read this this week on someone's social media. It was a Spurgeon quote, and I've known a long time. I just think it's great. Spurgeon said, If any man thinks ill of you, don't be angry with him, for you are worse than he thinks you to be. <laughs> I love that. I love that. But here's the Apostle Paul with his total freedom total freedom because of his healthy ego. How can this be possible? How can it be possible that someone can just come clean and admit their sinfulness, who has all this power, prestige, influence, popularity? I mean, that's something that if, if we had that, we would hold on to it. We would, we would grip it tightly. And the Apostle Paul's like, if you're putting a whole lot of prestige in me, if you're putting a whole lot of popularity in me, let me just tell you I'm the worst sinner there is. How can someone just come clean and say, I'm deep with sinfulness and yet still at the same time have incredible poise and incredible confidence and do the work that they were given for God? And I'll tell you how that's possible. Because their ego is not functioning in a natural state. Their ego is functioning like a redeemed, saved ego. And it's just working like a good shoulder just works, not drawing attention to itself. Now, the other side of that coin, though, is true for Paul as well. Because in Timothy, he says, I'm the worst sinner, but I don't let my sin, my sin acts, my sinfulness, I don't let that attach to my identity. I don't let that attach to my worth. I don't let that, that, that attach to my, my sense of self. But the other side of the coin is also true. He doesn't let his accomplishments attach to his sense of worth either. He doesn't look at himself in the mirror and say, well, the apostle, look at you, man. You are the apostle Paul. Like, people for centuries are going to know your name and read your stuff. He doesn't look in the mirror and congratulate himself. you got to understand that. Remember the context of this letter. Half the church that Paul was writing to in Corinth, half the church loved Paul. And they said incredibly positive things about him. And they talked about how amazing he was. And the apostle Paul never, ever believed his headlines. He never let those positive remarks connect to his worth or his identity. How is that possible? Because his ego is just healthy. It's acting in a redeemed way, not drawing attention to itself. You see, the Apostle Paul refuses to fall for the trap that meeting or failing to meet standards determines my self-regard, my identity, or how valuable I am. Now, let me just... 
Let me just pause here for, for one quick second and have a quick caveat. Let me say this. There are occasions when people resent others who have a healthy ego. There are occasions when people resent others who have a healthy ego. You know, healthy ego means you don't connect your failures or your accomplishments with your self-worth. So you have a healthy ego, one that's redeemed. There are times when people resent that about you. Do you know why we might resent that about them? Because people with a healthy ego ignore our power plays of judging them. People with a healthy ego ignore our power plays of judging them. I imagine that when this letter was read out loud in the Corinth church, the faction who was pro-Apollos and anti-Paul, whenever he said the words, I don't care that you judge me. I don't care that any human court judge me. As a matter of fact, I don't even judge myself. I imagine that the anti-Paul, pro-Apollos faction of that church was like, oh, I'm sure it was infuriating to them when they heard those words. Because here's the truth, and I'll just put this there for us to hear and pick up. We attempt to use our judgment of others for power over them. And when a person doesn't let any human's judgment, even their own, have power over them, it confuses us, and really, it can infuriate us. Don't you care about my bad opinion of you? Don't you care about my bad opinion of you? Well... Here's the thing. It's not that I don't care. It's that my opinion of me is actually worse. And I don't actually pay attention to it either. Well, don't you care about my high opinion of you? How I think you're so awesome and so amazing. Don't you care about that? No, no, hey, hold on. It's not that I don't care. It's just that I'm not getting any self-worth or any sense of self or any sense of value from your words of praise. You see, when someone has a healthy ego that doesn't get their sense of value and worth from either their failures or their accomplishments, from meeting certain people's standards or meeting their own standards, when someone has a healthy ego, we cannot, you cannot, and I cannot wield the power of shame or praise on those people. We can't use it on them the power of praising them, the power of shaming them, and that tends to make us a little resentful. And that's the end of that caveat. I just wanted to like put that out there because I think that we need to recognize two things, that when we're infuriated with someone who doesn't pay attention to our opinion of them, that might mean because that's their, that's their health showing. And then secondly, if you want to be a person who isn't, pushed around by the praise of people or the shaming of people. The pathway is to have a healthy ego, and this is what it looks like, the freedom that Paul has been describing in this text that I've been talking about. You know, and here's the thing. All of us, me, I couldn't be any more different than Paul. We couldn't be any more different than Paul. If I think I'm a great success, <laughs> I walk with swagger. If I think I'm a great failure, I lose all confidence and hang my head. My ego is puffed up and injured because I'm always thinking about who? Me. And I'm always thinking about how I'm doing in my own eyes and in the eyes of other people. Paul doesn't live like this. He doesn't think like us. His ego has found true humility, true gospel humility. His ego is not distended and inflated and empty. His ego instead is its, is its correct size, and it is not empty. It's filled up. It's whole. We couldn't be any different than the Apostle Paul. Now you think, listening to this, that this all sounds impossible. But this is the life of a gospel humble person. When you're a gospel humble person whose ego's been filled up and it's not empty, you're a person who does not need 
honor from others, but at the same time, you're neither afraid of that honor when it comes. You're a person who can listen to criticism for what God says to you in that moment and not go into despair because someone doesn't like you and believe everything they say about you and must believe everything that they think is bad about you is true. But neither are you a person who gets angry and, and because your pride has been hurt and you want to fly off the handle at the person who's criticized you. Instead, your healthy ego lets you listen without taking it in as a definition of who you are. When you have a healthy ego that's filled up and not empty, you're not a person who needs to be treated like you're important or special, but nor are you a person who thinks you're special or important when someone tells you that you are. You are a person who can gracefully win, and when you lose, you can be excited for the person who beat you. That's what a healthy ego looks like. And my Maddie, my 14-year-old, has given me the best example of a healthy ego in my life. On two occasions, she has lost golf tournaments by a very close margin on the last hole at the end of the round. And right after the round, we'd be looking at the score on both these occasions, and I was talking to her, and I was upset with her. And I said things like, you know, you could have done this, and you should have done that, and I don't know why. And both times she kind of interrupted me, and she expressed deep, authentic appreciation for the girl who had just beat her. One time it was a player who beat her, and that player shot in the 70s in a competitive round for the first time in her life. Another girl beat her who was almost two years younger than her. And both times, in the middle of my, well, you should have, and you could have, and I don't know why you didn't, Maddie says something like this. She said, Dad, I was glad they won. I know what they feel right now. What just happened to them will give them confidence to work even harder. And in both times, she said, I know how happy they are. And she could lose and have joy for the person who beat her. She could lose and just enjoy watching the winner win without thinking about the loser losing. Friends, that's an ego who has forgotten herself and is functioning in a redeemed way. In our next talk, I'm going to tell you how we get there how we can actually live this out every day. I'll explain to you where we are supposed to get our verdict from about our worth and about our value, about our self-regard, and how we get our ego to stop being puffed up and start being filled up. And friend, you need to hear me say to you, you have nothing to prove. And what I'm going to teach you in the next time that we're together will be something that will give you the freedom to truly forget yourself. To truly forget yourself and be free to just serve God and to just grow up in your faith and be mature in Christ. I hope you'll join us for the next talk. Father, thank you. Thank you for the truth that the Apostle Paul is laying out for us here. That he's a model. He's a model for us. Help us to, uh, to be like him. Help us to, to, to understand that if we look to other people's standards or our own standards for the verdict of our value or our worth, we're going to be disappointed. It's going to let us down. It's a trap. Lord, we want to live free. We want to have the freedom to say, hey, I'm the worst sinner in the room. And at the same time, have confidence and poise to serve you. We know it's possible because that's how Paul lived. And we'll talk about that, Father. Help us. Help us, Lord, to live this way. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs> So nice to worship with y'all today. Um, hopefully we'll see everybody in person as soon as possible. I hope everyone has a great week.
If you need something, email care at islandschristian.org. Bye.